This is an oral history interview as part of the Jack Kemp Foundation's oral history collection. It's an interview with Jack Kemp's oldest brother, Paul. Today is August 2nd, 2011. We're in San Francisco, California, and I'm Morton Kondracki. Um, Paul, how would you characterize the, your family life growing up? I would say it's kind of idyllic in an old-fashioned way. Uh, it was a very quiet, serene, uh, faith-based family. Uh, the parents were, I think, of old values and old, uh, you know, sort of old style of thinking. Uh, my dad was an extremely loyal, simple guy, not in a pejorative sense simple, but just a, a really simple, straight, loyal, loving man. My mother was an educated woman, and so she was a very energetic, uh, assertive, professional woman, sort of, and uh, the two of them had kind of an ideal of their own in which they raised their family, and that's kind of how we grew up. We were protected from uh, a lot of outside negative influences, even though it was in the midst of the Depression, and it was tough times, but we were kind of shielded from all of that, so we grew up in a happy, active household. Um, what are your standout memories about Jack Kemp as a kid? I would say standout memories would really amount to him trying to fit in and him playing games all by himself and, and accumulating statistics and records and uh, he would spend hours playing these spin the arrow games. They had professional football and baseball names attached to them. I wish I could remember now what that, who they were. They were famous players and they had these board games where you'd spin the arrow and it'd land on a number and you'd advance a player from one base to another or a team would make a touchdown or something. It was, and he'd play those by the hour and he'd keep notebooks of statistics on those games. It was really kind of uh, amazing. He would do that hour by hour. The other thing that we all did, but he did to a much greater extent, was listen to the, the old simulated ball games where some guy in a radio studio would be watching a, a teletype and then he would, uh, he would simulate the crack of the bat and, uh, and announce the game just as if he were there. And we, had, we played those all the time. Jack listened to those constantly. So sports, I, I see Jack out in front uh, throwing the ball endlessly. Anybody that he could get to catch for him. Uh, mostly football, but some baseball. And uh, So I would say sports, athletics, uh, Jack trying to race around and squeeze his way into the family. Squeeze his way into the family in what way? He was the third, well, I, was the third son. Right? To me, I, knowing that I was going to be interviewed by you, I, I began to think about, gee, what what kind of things did Jack do that made him into what he was today, and, uh, or what he is today in my mind? Um, and he was number three in the line of succession here, so Tom and I were already a unit. There was four of us in the family before Jack came along, and we all did things, normal family things together. And then five years later, after Tom, why, I'll take a moment to drink here. We are conducting an oral history interview here right now, and it would not be appropriate for any event to end tomorrow morning. Negative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What was that about? <laughs> room service. They wanted to check room service. Right. Whether you've been you've been rating the. the <laughs> okay, uh, so where should we where should we resume? Right where you were. Okay, go ahead. Just keep 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 going. Yeah, Tom and I were already a pair. I had grown up as a uh, kind of an indulged, spoiled little kid, and Tom came along, and the two of us like all kids, were then used to doing things together. Jack came along enough years later to where he kind of had to scramble to fit in. And like kids, kids are cruel and, and, uh, 
and we probably didn't want Jack to involve himself, you know, a little red-haired, pesky kid. So Jack kind of got pushed aside a lot, as kids are, kids tend to do. And to me, I think that's kind of what made Jack into the loner that I see him as a, him always have been, uh, always being. I think Jack essentially was a lone wolf who had such a great personality and a way of embracing people that uh, people didn't realize that. But he rarely stayed in one place very long or with one person very long. He was always out and about and around and over and doing. And so I, I see Jack growing up as kind of in that outsider influence and having to struggle his way into the family unit. And that's kind of what I think formed him into who he was in his later life. Did that answer your question? I've yes. Um, so the, you have the impression of Jack Kemp being a hail fellow, well met, politician, lots of friends, all of that. But I take it that there's a, a different Jack Kemp that that you knew as a right. growing up. So right. What what is this loneliness about this or this loner tendency about? Well, anybody who knows Jack, and I'd be interested to hear Dick's reaction to this, and I'd be interested to hear Joanne and, and maybe some of the kids, but Jack was a, uh, a considerably different person uh, with his loved ones and his family than I think he was with a lot of the rest of the world. Uh, Jack uh, essentially never stayed in one place in one state very long. He was always all over the place. Tom and I used to talk a lot about the fact that Jack seemed to just have to move, had to travel, had to move, had to go, had to go here, had to go there. Uh, it's hard to describe, but I see that as coming from the fact that Jack was number three in the, among the boys and sort of late in arrival and having to more or less fight and bite and claw his way into the family circle. Now, this is nothing psychologically bad. It's just, and in fact, it might be typical of the third child in any family that comes along that much time later. But so I see Jack as essentially a, a, uh, a loner in, in, a, in a quiet sort of a way. Does that mean that he wasn't intimate with all of you as life went on? Right. Jack, Jack, I, I hear again, I'd, I'd love to hear others opinions. No, we've never gotten into this kind of a subject, but I don't think Jack was very intimate with very many people, if really anybody, perhaps other than Joanne or his children, uh, until very late in his life, I'm sure, that uh, he got quite intimate. I'm sure of that. Uh, even with me later on in life, he got uh, closer. But uh, for a long time, uh, he, it was always Jack competing. No matter what he did, it was Jack competing. Jack pushing, pushing to win, pushing to achieve, something like that. And that doesn't leave much time for closeness with anybody around him that I could see. So later in life, what did you get intimate with him about? Uh, the nature of people and the nature of life and uh, how people react and how people think. Uh, he and I would compare notes at length on the phone a lot in the later years about different politicians and how they would react and how they would conduct themselves. And we, had a, we shared likes and dislikes of people and attitudes and... Uh, Religion, uh, in the sense that uh, where religion belonged and where it didn't belong, uh, how, how religion kept trying to intrude into government, and both he and I felt that was really wrong, and frequently in very bad taste, if not wrong. And uh, so we, we talked a lot about those kinds of things. Um, it never got what I would call extremely personal, but it did at times. Uh, and towards the end, of course, why, uh, especially uh, after he knew that he had been diagnosed with serious cancer, uh, it wasn't particularly terminal in his mind at that point, but he was quite frightened of it, I think. Then we did get a lot closer and talk about a lot more intimate things. Uh, 
immortality, mortality, uh, religion, God, things like that. Most of the time, uh, how often would you talk to him? After after your childhood was over and you you were all, you were gone and he was you know more uh, I I went off to college in 1946 and uh, as I mentioned earlier before we started taping that I was so enthralled with the good life of of USC that uh, I just kind of left home and left family and and joined in the fun. So I didn't see much of the family uh, from 1946 until probably the 50, 51 when I started to graduate. Um, Jack and I began to really communicate again at length in about 1956 or 7. And finally in, uh, in 59, I think it was, or 58, uh, Joanne could make this more clear to you, but he moved, he bought a home in, in Costa Mesa, California, in these new developments that had sprung up after the war. And I had already owned a little home there with my first wife. So Jack moved in just a couple of blocks away, and we saw a lot of each other then and managed to share books and our attitudes about cultural activities, music, art, things like that. So I would say uh, we sort of really began to talk more as adults in perhaps 57, 58, 59. And he was then doing what? Playing football, just starting to play football. For the Chargers. And in, in 57, he was drafted by the Steelers and then began that chain of, of trades and and uh, dismissals that he went through before he finally landed with the L.A. Chargers. While we're there, how did he take that whole experience of being cut time after time after time after time? Jack was so innocent in the beginning that I think it hurt him really bad. Uh, I can recall vividly when he went off to um, training camp in uh, where was it, Pittsburgh? The Steelers were originally not in Pittsburgh, were they? This, did, I've forgotten where the Steelers originally were. So wherever that was, it might have been, I can't think, was it Detroit or wherever the Steelers were originally, why? He went there and they had Bobby Lane as their old time veteran quarterback. And Lane was a hard drinking, hard partying, hard cussing guy who had been down the the path a long time and so Jack was immediately cast into that crowd as a rookie and I used to love the stories about him showing up Lane would say come on Jack would get dressed after practice and he'd say come on we're gonna go down and talk football so he'd go to the local bar and there'd be three or four guys there and of course Jack coming from a Christian science family certainly was no drinker and, uh, and this was Bobby Lane with his martinis or whatever he drank. And so Jack was shocked into the new world, the new life, and he'd come back and home and talk about that, and we'd hear stories of that. We'd all get a huge kick out of that. So Jack got introduced into that. Then when he got, the Steelers moved to, uh, I'm getting my football history wrong because I'm not thinking straight, but uh, he, once the Steelers, I'm sorry, he went with the Detroit Lions. No, I'm confused. Um, he got, they moved and traded him to the new team, or some of the players moved, Lane moved, and Jack moved with Lane, and then Jack got dropped, and that hurt him a lot. That really hurt him. Then he, then he eventually uh, ended up with the New York Giants and got dropped again, and then he went to Canada, and each time he was really hurt. I think a couple of times he just cried openly about that, and Jack was not one to to appear crying at all, to my memory. Finally, uh, our parents drove him to, uh, I think it was Calgary with the Stampeders, and he got he played a few games up there and got dropped up there and came back to no job. And so then he was off for a while, and then he got called by, I think it was, uh, who was the famous old coach of Notre Dame, famous guy during the... Frank Leahy. Yeah, Frank Leahy called him. 
and uh, he had been signed by the 49ers but couldn't play in their championship game because of ineligibility. And so he uh, immediately after that last game, he was signed on the field by Leahy and, and, I, I, and Sid Gilman. And I don't know if Baron Hilton was there at that moment or not, but Jack was literally picked up on the field at the end of that championship game. So does that mm -hmm. aim at your question? Good. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to the family now. Um, what would you say your father's ma major influences on Jack were? Love and sports. I, I would say it's hard to say which came first. Dad was an old ball player. He was a, an excellent ball player when he was uh, in high school. And he never, when he never, I don't think he even finished high school. I think the World War I draft took him out of high school and uh, put him in the Navy. And I think after the Navy, he went right to work. But Dad was a great ball player and a great handball player and a great, almost everything he did, he was a natural. And he was a, he had kind of an athletic, you know, the pro-athletic nature. He, he was, that's why I say he was a, a simple guy. He, uh, in, in a really good sense, loyal, loving, kind, uh, treated everybody as he wanted to be treated. The golden rule was major to him. Uh, so that's my dad. And I think that was the influence that, that permeated all of us. I think we all tried to emulate that in him. Some with success and some not, probably. Um, Dick s says that, uh, that your dad and his brother, Jack, had this incredibly close relationship and that that sort of inculcated a sense of brotherly love among you, you boys. Is that correct? I think that's absolutely correct. I think that's good of Dick to remember that. Uh, Jack was the youngest boy in a family of 12 kids. She actually had 13 and one died. Um, but Jack was the youngest and kind of the baby of the group. And my dad sort of fathered him all the way along through his life. Uh, dad bought him his, his first car. Uh, dad paid for a lot of things for Jack. Uh, and dad being an incredibly loyal guy to his mother, to his family, to everybody, um, was very, very loyal to Jack. And Jack was uh, a sparky, redheaded type guy, uh, great personality. And uh, Dad loved Jack, and I guess Jack loved Dad a lot. And so they would talk every single morning on the phone for as long as we were alive. Dad would get up and go to, uh, to work at 5.30 in the morning, and he and Jack would go downtown at a coffee shop and have breakfast every single morning, like at 6 o'clock and then go to work at their business. And this lasted their entire working adult life. What about the other siblings? I mean, there, there were all these 11 other kids. And out. they had such a wide range they? of ages that dad was close to many of them and not very close to some of them. Some of them were kind of independent, went their own way and stayed aloof from the family. And some were in our life almost constantly as we grew up. So dad was uh, very loyal to his mother. Uh, his mother was widowed early and uh, she had no place to go. And so during the Great Depression, she got kind of traded from family to family to family to take care of her after she gave up her last family home. And so uh, dad and Jack would support her for many of the final years. She lived with us during the Depression and she lived with Jack during the Depression. Um, was uh, your dad interested in politics at all? Dad was a fervent Republican, as was mother, and I think most of his family was. His famous most frequent joke was that uh, in 1932, he was still busy driving people to the polls to vote when Roosevelt had been elected hours before in New York, and he used to laugh about that every couple of years. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that he was fervent about politics, but he felt strongly. Mm -hmm. He felt strongly that we objected to Roosevelt and then to Harry Truman, and quite unjustly now, but that's 
how people feel. Why, why was he? Uh, why was he a Republican? Why was he I think his Roosevelt? mother and his family were. Um, I don't really know anymore about that. Why? I, it just kind of grew up with the family and. Um, so what was the economic circumstances? You owned a house, right? He owned a house. Right. And that must have been unusual in those days. I think my mother and dad were married in 25 or 26. I came along in 28. For the first year or two of my life, we lived over in a western portion of Hollywood. And then they bought this typical California bungalow on Plymouth Boulevard, and we moved there. And we grew up there, and, and the family stayed there until about 1950 or 51. I forget the, the year. And then my aunt and uncle had owned a home a few blocks away, and he died early years earlier. But when she passed away, she willed that to my dad, and uh, they moved over there to her house, Aunt Marie, Marie Kemp. But the economic circumstances of your family must have been oh, I got well, off the track. well above that of the ordinary person in those days to own a house, your own house. Well, more we grew up in a very, very middle class way in a very middle class neighborhood. Dad, Dad and his brothers, uh, Jack, Dad, and Willard, uh, I think the second or third oldest boy in the family. And a, a, a hanger-on, a, a, a young man that Grandma raised called Dugan, uh, that's all I know him by, he, those, those four brothers went into business as the Kemp Brothers Motorcycle Company. And they had the franchise for the Henderson Motorcycle, which I believe was a division of the Schwinn Bicycle Company. And uh, Mr. Schwinn took an immediate liking to my dad, although my Uncle Willard was the silverhead silver-tongued guy in the crowd, and he was the one who had gotten the franchise for the Henderson Motorcycle. So they became Western States dealer for the Henderson Motorcycle and sold these motorcycles to police departments and the CHP and state people all over the West. And they had a, quite a thriving business going up through, I would say, Probably 1930, 31, somewhere in there, the world began to change, obviously. And uh, they had a, a branch in Pasadena, and their main store was down on Main Street in Los Angeles. And so the circumstances were very good through that point. But then it developed that Willard had actually bankrupted the business. And the business went broke, bankrupt. And instead of declaring bankruptcy, while my dad and Jack paid off all those debts uh, in 10 or 15 more years, every dime, and took a lot of pride in that. Um, so our circumstances started out good. My mother had a great job when, when I was born. And they remained good up until perhaps the beginning of the Depression. Then we went way down the hill. And there was a time in the mid-30s when uh, we were broke. Dad. Uh, kept talking about not knowing later, he would never reveal this to us kids, but he kept talking about uh, how am I going to make the payroll on Friday? Uh, how am I going to do that? I just don't know. And he would pray and, 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 uh, and try to be very spiritual about where that payroll was going to come from and, and uh, with help from different people. My uncle Claire, uh, he always managed to make payroll. I can recall a birthday I think this was in 1936, where my friends and I were all sitting around the dining room table with mother and dad and brothers and neighborhood kids, and it was a party. We were having a birthday party for me in July, and uh, I finally said, gee, why aren't we going to the pier, to the pike, we used to call it, the Ocean Park Pier, rides and games and stuff. And I guess I made a fuss about it or something because all of a sudden mother began to cry. And then dad broke down and cried. And then I think within a little while why we got up and all went down to the pier. But they didn't have the money to go. It was just broke time. Before that, I think it must have been in 32, 33, uh, I was awakened at 9 or 10 at night by the doorbell ringing. And I got up and ran out, you know, kids jump up and run out, and the porch light was on, and Dad was going to the door, 
And there was a guy in a brown uniform with a Sam Brown belt on and a gun and holster and all that stuff. And Dad said, well, you can take the damn place. Take it. It's yours. And I didn't quite at the time understand what that meant, but he said, you can have the damn place. And we were being uh, evicted. And later on, when I interviewed my Uncle Jack, just like you're interviewing me, I got Jack to talk about that. And it was painful for him at the moment to talk about that. But he said that eventually Uncle Claire, Claire Kemp, was a very successful merchandiser up here in Burlingame, California. And he bankrolled much of the family's problems during the Depression. And he came and apparently rescued us. I know very, very few of the details of that. The parents would just never share that with us. That's not the family that Jack lived in, though. By the time Jack was growing up, I mean, he was alive in 1935, but barely. Un, 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 unable to know anything about right, this. He was still a baby. Right. So, so what kind of circumstances would he have grown up in? Things were improving. Dad uh, started out with a motorcycle business. And when the, the, when the motorcycle business collapsed, well, he took his inventory and made that into a, a messenger service and a small parcel delivery service. And he had contracts for driving stunt people at air shows were common during that period. They'd have low flying planes and stunts and people would parachute out. And these were common in those days. So dad would have the contract to provide three wheeled motorcycles to run out in the field and pick up parachutists and drive them in or pick up stars or VIPs and drive them into the stands. He did that quite a lot. Um, so by 39, that business had, had been converted into a, uh, a parcel delivery service. And I think it was in 37 or 38 that he bought a fleet of trucks and turned it into a little larger parcel delivery service. So by the time Jack came along and, and then Dick, why the, the war came along and began to pick things up and things improved very drastically then for us. So by the time the war started, things were much better and uh, the, the, the family was in much better shape. So it was, the lowest point was probably around 35, 36. And then around 37, 38, things began to get much better. So by the time Jack and Dick became of age why things were much better. He was entrepreneurial, your father. I, I don't know that I would, I, I, to some extent, certainly. I mean, he was a small business guy all the time. So that's all he knew. He was an excellent, he worked for a, a seed company, in, the largest seed company in Los Angeles when he got out of the Navy. And he, he would, the owners loved him. I mean, he was such a faithful employee that they gave him a company car to use personally and the whole family would use it. Uh, they just treated him royally because they loved him so much and I guess he must have been successful. But uh, he, um, so uh, small business was all he knew then after that. He got into this motorcycle business probably because Willard Kemp talked him into it. And um, so that's all he knew. He was, mm -hmm. kind of forced, he was kind of forced to stay entrepreneurial by that. Whether that was in his blood or not or in his mind or not, I really don't know. Dad was not a, a risk taker to, to, to much. Neither was Jack. They were both very conservative guys. Uh, let's talk about your mother. Uh, what would you say her major influences on Jack were? Intellect. Intellect. Uh, assertive intellect. Mother was uh, well educated for her time. Uh, she had a, a bachelor's degree, uh, I believe, in sociology from uh, University of Montana. And she came out west for a couple of years at Berkeley, California at Berkeley, and um, got an advanced degree, a master's, I believe, in one or the other. I forget which came first. And immediately upon graduation, she got a job with the LA City School District. And by the time she got married, why, she had a, a, a good job. I think it was up in the management hierarchy of the L.A. City school system. And I think she was in charge of truancy. She kept talking about her car and driver, and she 
uh, would frequently go out into the barrio and, and pick kids up and haul them to school. And I, I, I'm going to research that. I'm going to find out what she actually did. She was not a Spanish teacher. She spoke Spanish, fluent Spanish, but she never taught Spanish. I think that's a misconception. So was there ever any kind of family tension over the fact that she was so well educated and your dad wasn't? Yeah, yeah. What kind? I don't know that it was, it's hard, again we were shielded, but dad would always pick at her and say, well you're the expert, you know that better than I do, or, or he'd, he'd always uh, push at her, preck at her uh, at times, and mother was being assertive She'd say, well, this is this, 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 and that. And Dad would say, yeah, well, you know all that because you're so smart or you're... But Dad was not the kind of a guy that would ever continue that or keep that going. Or I don't think he inwardly... I'm sure he felt inadequate or inferior because of that. I, he always kept saying, I never finished school. He always kept referring to that. So I'm sure he felt some degree of inadequacy because of that. But again, he was a... A sunny guy. He, he, I mean, that always prevailed. What was the basis of this? When you say that your mother had the influence of uh, inculcating in intellect into Jack, what did you mean by that? Mother was an educated woman, and she was, uh, again, assertive, as I use that word, and she was uh, alive, very much alive, very inquisitive, very much in tune with the world's affairs, and, uh, and she pushed us intellectually all the time. Uh, we'd sit there at the dinner table, and what started out as a discussion would end up as a big battle, bang, bang, between us. Uh, mother would foster that. She would get that going. She would ask questions and we'd tease each other about pronouncing words. Uh, Dad finally would get up and throw his napkin down in disgust and walk away. That happened over and over and over again. He just, he couldn't take the, the dissension. But we regularly had those arguments and battles and, you know, it's tough to use the word battle, but these are, you know, four growing boys, all assertive and pushy and, and aggressive and sitting at the dinner table. We ate dinner every single night at home. Uh, there wasn't, I can't recall. We hardly ever went out. Probably they didn't have the money to go out most of the time. But, but mother would, uh, would inculcate us with current events and thoughts and ideas and opinions all the time. Constantly. Can you remember? So this included Jack. I'm, that's what I'm getting at. Jack. Can, can you remember any of the subject matter or how the how the action went? In well, it depends on what was happening. Uh, uh, in '36, why there was the Hindenburg disaster, and so we got into dirigibles and and Germany and uh, why dirigibles and what was going on with them. The 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 king was crowned uh, in, in England, and that became a huge subject for us to talk about England and the history and the crown and royalty, and uh, why royalty and who, what royalty, where, and the, all of these sorts of subjects. Uh, there's an interesting point that we can touch on or not about our projector at home and, and the films that we used to rent, but uh, that was more on the entertainment side. Intellectually, I think that mother would, uh, I, see here again, I can talk about her relationship with me a lot, but I, I wasn't too conscious of how that directly affected Jack, but I know that he would have been just like Tom and Dick all were, uh, uh, di directly affected by mother's intellect and her thinking and her constant push of intellectual curiosity. Do you remember Jack's participation in any of these? Yes, I do. I, he was, he was Jack. He was very assertive and aggressive, and and argued a lot. And I can't specifically remember the arguments, but we ranged all over the map. And there was a lot of sports talk, uh, the Hollywood stars and and the L.A. football team, uh, Bulldogs. I think I've forgotten their name now, but uh, we used to go to a lot of ball games and and a lot of events. Uh, and those had come up and we'd talk about those, but 
Jack was just one of the gang by the time I remember all of this. Early on he wasn't, but then as he grew up and got... And he was a kind of, a, at first, a pesky little red-haired, pesty kid. And then he kind of grew up and began to think and talk and argue, and we just kind of went on that way until I went off to college. And I'm assuming they probably continued that way, but, but by the time I went off, why, uh, Tom was close to going off to college, too. So that uh, probably broke up an awful lot of the, what had happened originally, and I really don't know much about what went on there, except when I came home, it was much the same. So I get the impression that your dad was the sports person and your mom was the right. was That's the essentially correct, yeah. Dad was an athlete and involved in sports, uh, belonged to the Hollywood Athletic Club until the recession, depression forced him out of it. Uh, but uh, he used to play handball up there on a weekly basis, perhaps during the week also, I've forgotten. Um, and he was very good at it. Apparently, he won tournaments up there. Uh, this was the Hollywood Athletic Club, which was a division of the LA Athletic Club. So dad was the athlete, mother was the intellect, mother was the educated person. Uh, dad would express ideas and thoughts on politics, but it was mainly mother who led the charge. And I think Dick said in his book that she was the values person that she was the disciplinarian? You know, that's, that's easy to say, but uh, I can remember being very afraid of Dad's moods when he would suddenly get tired of the problem and, uh, and uh, he never struck us, never laid a hand on us, but somehow we were really afraid of Dad when he got angry, which was very rare. But mother was the one who was always carping at manners and carping at this. And car dad, dad would too, but he was more of the quiet, passive side, and mother was the aggressive side. Mother would always push on manners and attitudes and, and values, as Dick says. That's right. That they both were highly valued. Dick, dad would talk a lot about values and, and how to treat people and how not to treat people and things like that. And how did Jack absorb all that stuff? Mort, I, it's just like I did and like Tom did as far as I know. Uh, it just all worked its way into his conscience and his memory bank and uh, that was it. Uh, I, don't I don't recall any specifics about Jack uh, in this particularly. So what, what exactly was the role of sports in your, in your family? I became, dad being an athlete was always athletic and was always playing ball in, in pickup groups or handball. Uh, I developed a very, very severe asthma when I was two years old or two and a half. So that kind of pushed me out of any athletic effort at all. I was barely able to move much of the time for several years. Tom was a natural athlete. Tom was Mr. Athlete. Uh, everything came so easily to Tom that it was almost uh, amazing. Uh, Jack then came along after Tom was well into pitching and throwing and running. And, and we had an awful lot of pickup games out on the street in our neighborhoods. A lot of the kids were very good at stickball and football and baseball. We played right out in the street. And uh, I'm sure Jack got into that crowd uh, as he came along. And I, I just remember him constantly uh, pitching and throwing on the front lawn, constantly, with whoever he could get to catch the ball. Um, but your main point was, well, did, I, just did wondered, I miss your main point? Well, um, um, Somebody has described this, maybe it was Jack himself, um, at some point saying that uh, sports was all day, every day, morning, noon, and night. That's true, of Jack. Uh, and probably of Tom for much of the time, too. And Dad would, uh, would come home late at night, you know, in the summertime at least, and he would catch for Jack or Tom. Uh, 
What were your mother and dad's attitudes to, toward competition? Competitive. I wouldn't say uh, overly so, but uh, competitive. Mother was a real competitor. She was, I take it, the captain of her basketball team up in Montana. I don't she, think she played after she left Montana, but uh, she was a, a tall woman for her age, and so she played basketball, and I guess was quite good at it from what her friends have told me. But she didn't participate in sports when you were kids, did she? Mm -mm. So in what way was she competitive? Just, just in encouraging winning. Just in encourage. Well, by competitive, then I do you mean personally competitive? Not really. No, I, I, I don't see that. I just see her as encouraging a winning attitude and saying that you will win, you can win, and don't worry about it. You'll win. Uh, that type of thing. Did. Uh did she or he, your father make you boys competitive with one another? No, I don't think so. I think we were competitive enough without, uh, without anybody encouraging us. I think we were all very competitive siblings. We just constantly bang, bang, bang together all the time. What about fighting? You know, Dick is a better judge of this between himself and Jack. He'll, he'll tell you about that. I think he and Jack swung it a few times at each other. Tom and I get into it a little bit here and there. Uh, you can't help it living in a small house. Uh, not a lot of that. Not a lot of that at all. Uh, mother was the peacemaker, and Dad was the peace. They, they were all peacemakers. They were just they cooled it. No need to fight, no need to. And we were aggressive young teenagers, and so we managed to, to not obey that, very, and we'd fight, we'd, we'd get into it. But not, not a lot of physical stuff. Um, Dick actually told me that, that the rivalry was between Jack and Tom, that Tom was such a great athlete that Jack either emulated him or... or no, that's it. true. Jack emulated Tom. I think Jack hero-worshipped Tom greatly. When Tom died, Jack was devastated, and that's what he expressed to me all the time, was that his hero had died, uh, had left. That was, it, that was what came out so clearly when, when Tom died. That, when did Tom die, and what did he die of? Gee, uh, he had a heart attack in the swimming pool in Laguna on a morning workout, and that must have been uh, more at seven or eight years ago now. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific, but uh, I'd say it was um, 2005, six, seven, somewhere in there. And Jack was devastated. I uh, I got a call one morning. Nancy and I were headed down to to the Los Angeles area, and um, I got a phone call from Jack's office, and I I immediately called back from the car, and Jack was just absolutely out of control. He was so upset and crying. And, and uh, I, I was shocked. I mean, it took me totally by surprise. Everybody was shocked, of course. So I think Jack was very clearly Tom's, Tom was very clearly Jack's hero. And uh, that's really easy to see because Tom was already well established playing games in football and baseball both. He was I think an all-city athlete in both baseball and football. He was a southpaw pitcher and a southpaw single-wing quarterback. And at Fairfax High, Tom was already a class president and, you know, the athlete worship stuff. And so Jack was following right along behind that and uh, came up after that. And I think Tom was his role model and his hero. But I don't think there was competition between them other than just getting into it a little bit at sports at home or something. But Jack was argumentative, so there would be a lot of argumentative question and answers and type stuff on sports. Different teams, different st statistics, different players, different opinions, you know. Um, somehow crying, even with your brother dying, but, but also when you're cut from a football team and stuff like that, doesn't fit with the notion of tough guy football player. 
How do you square that? I'm probably not a good source on this question, but I could tell you that Jack was not an emotional guy when it came to crying or expressing sorrow or uh, sadness. Uh, the only times I can remember him crying were two or three times after he got cut. One time, I think it was after the Steelers cut him, that was about the worst time, and then when Tom passed away. But there was no other history of that to my knowledge. Um, so where did Jack get his all this competitive spirit? Was it it was from his mother? You think your your mother? I just think he grew up with it, Mort. I think that he uh, he was Mister Outside, as I said in the beginning, and I think he started out having to kind of work his way into the family, and that's what made him into a, a guy that wanted to succeed and and. Uh, and I think he kind of grew up, uh, in, in a sense, alone, and uh, which is ridiculous to say it when you look at the closeness of our family. But uh, within that context, why he was kind of a loner in terms of Tom and me being a team together already. Did he ever talk about competition and no. winning? and Not to my knowledge. Well, oh yeah, winning is everything by the time he got into sports. Oh, yeah, no, winning was a big deal to him, and he t preached it to his kids, preached it to all of us. Oh, one question about your mother. She's the one who said to you kids, be a leader, right? I think so, yes. What did she mean by that, or how often did she say it? Because Jack always said it to his kids. Right, but this was mother to Jack probably later on. I don't remember that to me at all. I think I heard it probably second or third hand uh, that must have been to Jack and Dick later on when they were growing up. There's, you know, two eras in, in looking back. There was the Tom and Paul era in the beginning, and then there was the, the Jack and Dick era later on as we all separated. Um, what, uh, what values or uh, did, do you think sports inculcated into Jack? Discipline. Uh, Jack was an amazingly disciplined guy, uh, relatively undisciplined in some ways, but, but very disciplined, very able to do the tough things that he had to do in order to win. Very, he started out uh, lifting weights and working hard on weights and, and conditioning when he was very young. Uh, he as determined that that, pardon? As a kid? Yeah. When he was, uh, he looked at his body and said, wow, what a weak thin-looking body. I don't like my legs. I don't like my arms. Uh, I don't like being white-skinned. He wanted to get a tan. He wanted to be built up. So he began to build up and he began to uh, lift weights strongly every day at home and at gym. And he used to grunt and we'd tease him and mother would laugh at him. And uh, he used to make, you know, make these grunting workout noises. I guess he was, that's part of the drill. But uh, we all used to laugh at him for that, but he didn't laugh. He was very serious about that. And uh, he had a whole set of weights right at home, and he'd stand there and lift and lift and lift. And in my collection, I have pictures of him doing that at home. And did he do that in order to be a quarterback at, at Fairfax, or what was that even before that? No, I, I think that was uh, before that. I think he just decided he didn't, he didn't like his skinny teenager body and uh, decided he was going to build it up. And of course, in those days, it wasn't Jack LaLanne then, but it was some early Charles guy that Atlas. Have, yeah, right. <laughs> Charles Atlas on the magazine covers and everything that was, you know, that would emphasize, I can build you up into a real man. And, and I think Jack just got into that flow and began to work hard at it. But he was always a conditioning guy, always a conditioning guy, to my knowledge. Um, but how was he as a student? Here again, you're kind of out of my field, but I think he was plenty good enough. I think he, uh, I, Mort, I can't answer that very well. That's probably a good one for Dick. Uh, wh what was he undisciplined about? You said he was undisciplined about something. Uh, probably uh, uh, spur of the moment, uh, uh, impetuousness, uh, He'd do some 
crazy kid stuff, driving, and uh, I think he wrecked one of Dad's trucks one time trying to turn too quickly into a building or something. Jack was not a patient guy at all. Uh, I think those of us who knew him, the you'll, people you'll interview will tell you that he was not a patient guy. He was quite impatient and quite impetuous to move on, do something, get going, think of something else. How, how did that manifest itself besides the driving a truck into a building? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't think of anything right now, but I just know that he was uh, impatient. He could never, it, he was famous for that. He would, he picked Nancy and me up in, in, uh, at home one time up in North and we, uh, we no, I guess we drove to Sacramento. He was out for Jeff's ball game and I'm driving my Cadillac up into Sacramento and Jack and Joanne got in and uh, I'm driving along through traffic in the rain and Jack says, Paul, you're not driving fast enough. Let me drive. Okay, Jack, all right. I got out and let Jack drive and man, he cruised around in the rain as if, as if he were dry all by himself on the road. Uh, he, he was kind of a very impetuous, impatient guy in many, many ways. So that was how the only thing I would say that he was kind of undisciplined. He never did conquer his impatience, I don't think. Uh, and it, 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 it evinced, it, was, it manifested itself in so many ways that I just can almost not think of it. He was uh, forever saying, Joanne, where's this? Why don't we have that? What, Paul, why don't you do that? What's the matter? Why, why can't you do that? Why? And he was just always impatient with something or other, never quite satisfied. Uh, he always wanted something right now, quick, fast. Uh, did he get mad at people when they didn't jump? He'd get flash irritated. Yeah, he'd get irritated. He'd, he wouldn't get what you'd call really angry. He just got severely irritated. <laughs> Yeah, he yeah he would flash. He would flash at people. Swear? No. Oh, lightly maybe sometimes, but uh, not to the point that you'd ever notice it. I don't think. Back to the intellectual uh, business. W were there books around the house? Yes, lots of them, lots of them. And did he read? Oh yeah, very much so. I don't know when he started reading. Um, Athletics was so dominant in his consciousness that I don't think he really began to read until probably high school uh, and then college. I think college is what lit his fire a lot. And by the time he got down to Costa Mesa in 1959, he was uh, very well read and he and I were talking about books. But at that time, Jack was mainly reading politics and economics and, and history. I got him into a whole other side of books and, and cultural activities. And we, I, I remember I, I took him a copy of Irving Stone's Darrow for the Defense, Clar Clarence Darrow for the Defense. And he raved about that book and began, we began to talk about it and talk about Clarence Darrow and then all the things that Darrow did and for the rest of his life, Jack always used to say, and I would blush and deny it, but Jack would say that I was the one that, uh, that gave him the love of reading. I don't, I don't believe that. I think Jack was, that's part of Jack's flattery. But I don't think that ever left his mind, that he had suddenly discovered a whole new branch of reading and a whole new type of reading from the time that we were together down in Costa Mesa. Uh, I then gave him a copy of Stone's uh, uh, Michelangelo book, uh, Agony and Ecstasy or something like that. And we used to talk about that kind of Renaissance history and stuff like that. So that kind of awakened Jack in some way. And, uh, and we'd talk about the ballet and we'd talk about uh, concerts and we'd talk about music and we'd listen to music together sometimes. And uh, I gave Jack some records, some classical records, which he ended up really liking and loving. And uh, is that on your question? Am I am I on the track? Right. Yes. Um, at Occidental, supposedly he was into music and ballet and. You know, here again, like I have to that, give. Where did that come from? Mother, mother, mother pushed. Did you go to ballets, concerts? 
when you were kids? Yes, 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 yes. Our, our mother would push that. Uh, I had elocution lessons when I was like five years old. Uh, I, I then had violin lessons for 10 or 12 years. Tom had piano lessons. I think Jack had clarinet lessons or something, and Dick played an instrument. I've forgotten now what that was. But we were raised kind of in the, the new modern way of raising kids in those days. Mother was a, a professional person, and she kind of had this, I suppose, a modern way of raising her kids, and so that's how we were raised. So Jack got his music from mother, and, uh, and, and partially me. Uh, I, I love music. But one of the things growing up in Hollywood gave us was we lived right in the middle of the film community. Uh, two doors up and a girlfriend of Jackie's for a time, or Dick's I guess, was the casting, the, the head of casting for Columbia Pictures. And down the street and across was uh, Otto Pierce, the cameraman on Cecil B. DeMille's uh, big epics. Uh, down the street on our side, three or four doors with were the Binion brothers, the stars of, of uh, a long-running radio serial. Uh, next door to us, the point I'm really trying to get to, was um, Kurt Rear, who was first chair cellist for the L.A. Philharmonic. He moved in next to us. I think he had been in New York. He was a German immigrant. He'd come from Germany to play in the United States. And he became the, uh, the first chair cellist of the Philharmonic, but then he would go to the Hollywood Bowl, and many times I would drive up with him at 6 o'clock and sit way up in the stands, uh, and he took Jack, I think, several times. Or at least Jack went to the Hollywood Bowl a lot. Mother would take us. Uh, we frequently went to the bowl during the summer. Uh, I don't recall going to concerts uh, downtown. I, I remember it was always Hollywood Bowl. Art galleries? Yes, yes, to some extent. Uh, nothing extraordinary, but I can, yes, I can remember we went to uh, art galleries, museums a lot. Mother would haul us to museums. Did people in your family have any particular heroes? Or did Jack have any particular heroes besides Bob Waterfield? <laughs> Bob Waterfield, Otto, Otto Graham. Uh, I think he did, but more I can't recall right now. Sports figures, major sports figures, uh, the guys that were had their names on these games that he would play uh, were always uh, his heroes. And what about <clears throat> what about your dad and mom? Did they have any particular outside heroes that they talked about who weren't sports figures, or were they into sports too? I can't remember any right now. That's okay. a good question for me to ponder. Okay, let me ask you about uh, the place of Christian science in your family. Were your parents always scientists? No. Uh, apparently, grandmother uh, got interested in or converted to Christian science in South Dakota. And I think she brought that out to her family a little bit. And I think that, I think Dad and Jack picked that up. There were no other Christian scientists in the Elva Mary Kemp family that I know of. Uh, when I first went to Sunday school in ninth, this must have been 1932 or three. I went to a, a Christian church down on uh, Wilshire Boulevard, and I went to Sunday school there for several Sundays. And I came home and told Mother what I did, and uh, I don't think she liked that. And suddenly I found myself in a Christian science Sunday school. So somehow that happened when I must have been six or seven years old. And uh, from that point on, they were very dedicated Christian scientists. They both were readers in the church. Readers are uh, the Christian science substitute for preachers. Uh, uh, mother was a reader uh, first, and then dad became a reader. I, I'm sorry, it was just the reverse. Dad must have become a reader in 1940, 41 or 2, and Mother became a reader after that. And were you, did you kids develop into readers too? No, no. 
Dick eventually became a Dick. Dick eventually, clergyman. Dick was the deepest into church of anybody and became a Christian Science chaplain in the Marine in the in the Navy, assigned to the Marine Corps, and served over in Vietnam in some horrific conditions, uh, which is another book of his that's just wonderful. But Tom was a dedicated Christian Scientist. I've sort of been in and out of it my whole life, uh, never out of it really, but just di differing in, uh, in depth and differing in a uh, discipline to it. But both dad and mother were very devoted. And Jack? Jack was into Christian science a lot until he married Joanne. And I think during that point, uh, uh, I think he converted and became a Presbyterian. But he had become a, a class-taught Christian scientist before he married Joanne. Was there any distress in the family about his conversion? Oh, I don't think so. There might have been, but here again, the folks never the folks never would share any of that with us. Um, I take it the family took to Joanne when she turned up when, when oh, he was in Oh, very much so. Oh, yeah, she was wonderful. I think, yeah, she was an instant hit with the family. Oh, she's such a terrific person. Um, so what are the values exactly that Christian science inculcates into people and Spirituality, loyalty, honesty, uh, you know, all the good stuff. Uh, worship God, be humble, um, try to forget about self, uh, try to forget about the material world uh, and focus on the spiritual side of things. Uh, honesty, hard work, uh, you know, all the old-fashioned values were what they put forth. That's why I started out calling him an old-fashioned family. Well, what about this notion of being positive all the time? I mean, that the, that the world is essentially good and everything's going to turn out all right. I mean, some people have said that Jack Kemp was an inveterate optimist and that this comes from Christian science. Is there any connection there? Sure. I, I think that's the foundation rock of Christian science is that God made all, and, and since God is good, then all is good, and so everything has to be uh, good. And so that's, that's a bedrock foundational item in Christian science. And so you're encouraged to see that in everything rather than to see anything evil or wrong. So that's, I'm sure that had a major effect on Jack. And Plus, he's just, he was just a very positive guy uh, in his nature, so. Um, so what about, what about injury and sickness and stuff like that? Here, Jack Kemp is, he gets injured again and again and again and again and again, even in high school, I guess. Sure. So does Christian Science say anything about what to do about when you're injured? Sure. Well, Christian Science is a, is, is a silent healer. And so uh, nothing was ever really said, but I, was, I recall sitting in the stands at Oxy and uh, Jack was carried off the field unconscious and Dad would just get up and we'd both walk down to the locker room and uh, I'm sure Dad was praying that whole time. And uh, Jack would come to and they'd pass smelling salts under his nose and, and the next thing you know, he'd be out on the field again for the last half uh, or the fourth quarter playing his head off. So, uh, again, it's a silent process, so I couldn't tell you that there was any overt expression of anything. I'm sure mother and dad uh, spent a lot of time praying. Um, now, Dick records somewhere that when, that not only did they drive him up to Canada to, when he joined the football team up there, but when he got cut, they drove him back and he was in distress, and your mother said something like, um, don't worry when one door closes, another one opens. I mean, is that something that she often said, or did sure. you, do you remember that story? That's, that's what she would say. That, I don't recall that specifically, but I'm sure that's what she said. That was what she was always saying. That was how she was always talking. She was sort of well-known for that within the family. 
Um, anything else about Christian Science that you think is important to know in assessing Jack's character? Not really, Mort. I, it was just the family style of thinking, and so he was raised in that environment, and I'm sure it had some residual effect on him. So he started wanting to be a pro quarterback when? Probably high school. You know, probably dreaming about it when he was a little kid playing those games. Probably dreaming about it from the beginning. Little kids dream, we all do. We all have our secret ambitions, and I imagine that's when he decided he wanted to be a, an Otto Graham or a Bob Waterfield or something like that. And did the family think that he had a chance? I don't think anybody thought about it. I'm sure that mother and dad would have said, sure, go ahead, you can do that. If you want to do it bad enough, you'll do it. But I don't think anybody uh, would particularly take him very seriously. I think at the time that this was going on, they were so focused on just survival and getting things done and managing four boisterous kids that uh, I, I just don't know specifically about that. Uh, when he was playing at uh, Fairfax, did everybody go to the games, the, the whole family? Uh, no, not, not all the time. I only went to a very few. Tom, no, there were so many games uh, that uh, we just couldn't make many of them. I know mother and dad, uh, mother wasn't too fond of going. She was always so afraid. Mother was very fearful. Uh, what? Of anything mother's fear. Uh, injury, uh, uh, accidents, I'm sure that she prayed a lot over, over that stuff. Uh, she was, she was, uh, I would say equally tending to fear as much as she was uh, assertive and, and uh, outgoing. And, and uh, I, to looking back, I think my mother was a very powerful woman in a in a quiet way, a motherhood way. In a, in a Your brother Dick actually says that uh, you lived in a matriarchal household; that she sort of was the dominant figure. I think that's very true. I think that's very true. Dad was uh, far more passive than mother. But then dad was the guy that had to go to work every morning uh, at 5.30 and got home but 6 or 7 o'clock at night and uh, and was always trying to make that payroll that I mentioned. Uh, and he, again, he was a simpler guy. He Mother, mother was considerably more intellectually complicated than dad ever was. I mean, that raises the question, how do they ever get married? Good question. I don't know. Mother, mother's family used to winter. They were, they were Montanans with huge ranches in eastern Montana. And they would winter in Pasadena. And somehow the families got together and mother met dad and they ended up getting married. But they were very, very different people. But dad was a lover. Dad was a very loving guy and a very, uh, he loved women and loved, uh, but again, his sense of loyalty and honor would never permit him to be much of a carouser of any kind, but he was just, he was, he was really a lover and women flocked to him his whole life, in my recollection. How about Jack? Did Jack have a lot of girlfriends? I think so. He had several, I know. Uh, but again, athletics was always the dominant aspect for Jack, uh, if not politics and stuff like that. But Jack was an athlete. That was his main focus. You got your status in the Kemp household by being intellectual, by being a, a sports standout, not chasing girls, I take it. That's right. That's right. Mother and dad would never have permitted much in the way of and we do, I don't think any of us have really had that on our mind most of the time. Uh, Tom was just a, an absolutely attractive guy, and uh, he just he never even really tried to, to do much. He was an athlete. Tom was folk, but Tom was Mr. Loose Goose. Mr. Hey, I just stand here and it falls on me. Uh, and so he, Tom never appeared to do anything to get anywhere or go anywhere or do anything. It just all 
happen to him. And of course, that's a, a false image, but that's the way that he would look to people, to me, too. Tom was an amazing guy. Um, so Jack goes to Occidental. Why did he go to Occidental as opposed to USC where you and He Tom worshipped uh, uh, the track coach there. Uh, I don't think the, tra the co track coach is a very famous guy. The name just doesn't quite come to mind real quickly, but I'm sure you'd know it more. At, uh, oh gosh, it'll come to me. But the track coach was uh, an Olympic champion, famous coach, and uh, Jack wanted to be with him. So did he go there to, to, to do javelin uh, as opposed no, to I being a football he, no, player? No, I, I think he just went there to be with that coach. I don't really know the answer to that, I guess, in very much detail. I just know that he worshipped that coach and that he went there to be a part of that. It may, it may have been track that he was, although he was mainly enthusiastic about football and baseball, but gosh, the name of that coach, it'll come to me probably after we're on the way home. Um, so did the family go, go, go to games at Oxy? Sure, yeah, quite often, every week. I only made a few because by this time I was at SC and, uh, or beyond. Um, but yeah, dad would go as often as he could, mother sometimes. Again, I, she was reluctant to go because of her fear. Um, why did he major in physical education if he was into intellectual? Uh, that subjects? was his life. Uh, that was his life and his whole sole interest until he woke up to the fact that he loved politics and loved ideas and loved more complex intellectual things. And at that point, then he added political science. So I think he graduated in both, didn't he? I'll have to find out. Um, so uh, then he goes, he, he goes through all this uh, trials and tribulations about being a, a pro football player, but then he finally lands. So did you all yes. go to Chargers games oh, yeah. all the oh, time? Oh, yeah. Sat in the Coliseum when the L.A. Chargers played in 19, I think their first season was 1960, and there'd be 5,000 of us in that 100,000-seat stadium. And it was Jack running around the field trying to pass the ball, as usual. That was the way he looked in high school and the way he looked in college and the way he looked for the Chargers. Racing around trying to evade the other guy's linemen and linebackers and trying to find a receiver open and get the ball to him. It was a lot of fun, I'll tell you. Uh, did, did he ever talk to you about Sid Gilman? Oh yeah, a lot. What did he say? Sid Gilman was kind of like a surrogate father to him. Uh, that Sir, Sid Gilman publicly announced, uh, I think more than once, but one time very dramatically to, in a news conference that if he'd had a son, he would want that son to be Jack Kemp. And uh, it caused quite a stir in the, in the press. Uh, Jack uh, would talk to me about what Sid would talk to him and how Sid would push him and nudge him and, and uh, uh, argue with him and fight with him over how to do things and how to win and how to Sid, Sid was quite a coach. He, he was, you know, he was such an advocate of the passing game that, uh, that he was a great coach for Jack in that sense. And I think he brought out the best in Jack. Jack admired him. Very much. Felt very loyal to him. Um, so how did he feel when Sid Gilman let him go on waivers to the Buffalo Bills. You know, I, I was living, I was separated from my first wife at the time, Mort, and I was living in Denver. Jack showed up. Um, I had season tickets to the Bronco games. Jack showed up and stayed with me when the Chargers came to town. I, yeah, I think this was his next to last year with the Chargers. And it had to be 1960, 60, 61 or 62. Jack showed up and, and stayed with me at my home in Denver, and uh, he was very, very, very upset and sad. It turns out that he, at that time, he would never admit this to me later, but Al Davis was on his case, and Al was giving him a very, very bad time. Why? I, I don't know the specifics. All I know is that Davis did not like Jack at that time. 
Neither one would ever admit that now. They'd probably very much deny it. But at the time, I recall being very worried for Jack that Davis was going to get him, that Davis was going to, and sure enough, I think Davis did get him eventually. I think Jack was, the story goes that uh, Jack was put on waivers to hide him, but I, I think all that time Al Davis had been working to, to get Jack pushed out. So what did Jack say about what the Davis problem was? I think they disagreed. I think I think they disagreed on on uh, on playing approach tactics. I think that Davis, I can't say for sure, Mark, but I think it was that that uh, Jack was a favorite of Gilman's, and uh, Gilman kept favoring Jack over other players. I think Davis resented that. Davis felt he was the God's gift to the uh, to the offense of the Chargers. He was the offensive coordinator at the time. I think Gilman kept overruling, and I think either out of jealousy or anger or resentment or something, Davis just turned against Jack. I don't know anything more specific than that. But I know at that time that when Jack showed up in Denver, he was very, very worried and very upset and very concerned, and he was specifically mentioning Al Davis being out to get him. But Gilman was still the coach. Mm -hmm. So was it an accident, or was was Gilman unhappy? When Jack broke his uh, his middle finger in San Diego at a game, and they pulled him out. And uh, they gave him, it was a tight game, and they gave him an injection of Novocaine. And he went back in, and, and after every pass, he would dislocate that finger again, and he would reset it himself out on the field. He'd stick it back in the socket or whatever you do with a dislocated finger. And he'd throw that ball, and that was his last game for the Chargers. Um, so he got wavered. How deliberate or how uh, accidental it was is another question. Here again, I privately, personally think it was Al Davis that uh, engineered it. Gilman uh, is somehow credited with trying to hijack and uh, he ended up getting, quote, discovered by, uh, by the, the Buffalo Bills, and uh, they had a coin toss in Kansas City or St. Louis, wherever the AFL headquarters were, and uh, Buffalo won the coin toss. That's my version. Now, I think there's other versions of it, uh, but uh, I think Buffalo won the coin toss. Jack found himself on an airplane the next day flying from... San Diego Airport to uh, Buffalo, New York, and the rest is history. And how did the family feel about him suddenly taking off for the east, east side of the country? Our family? Yeah. I think we were all very concerned. I think we were all regretful. Playing for the Chargers was a heck of a lot more it's closer to us, more fun. It was more accessible to us than... Uh, and Buffalo seemed like a different country to us at the time. Uh, and we couldn't imagine somebody, Buffalo, where is Buffalo to Californians? So uh, we were all worried. Actually, Jack had a great time, which isn't your question, but, uh, but he, he ended up having an extremely good time. Buffaloans just took him to their <laughs> bosom, and, uh, and uh, he loved skiing, even up in Buffalo, where there aren't that many good hills for skiing. Why, he loved skiing, skied a lot up there. He and Joanne had a great life up there. But he came back fairly often. He, didn't he w uh, work for Governor Reagan? And During the <coughs> off-season in the Charger era, he worked for Governor Reagan in California and Sacramento. Uh, that would have been in the uh, very early... 60s, I think. Uh, and I recommend that you talk to Sal Russo about that. I think he met Sal in those days, and uh, he and Sal became very close in the Reagan fraternity. And that friendship with Reagan uh, lasted and, and, until Jack, uh, until Reagan passed away. <coughs> Sorry about this. <clears throat> Let me get it. Let's, let's stop for a drink of water. So when did you first ex uh, suspect that Jack was going to go into politics? 
uh, with Governor Reagan, I think. He, he found a real home uh, up here in Sacramento. I think that lit that secondary fire in him that gave him the, uh, the ultimate desire to get into politics. And of course, Jack was constantly espousing ideas. He was constantly trying to convince people of the right way. I'm sure that that led him to feel like, hey, I got to get into a position where I can make myself heard and felt. So I'm, I'm sure that he began to think that he could do that. I, I don't, I think it took him kind of still by surprise when they finally got a hold of him in Buffalo and suggested that he run. But uh, I think that had been kind of his background goal all along. Back in the days when you were when you were neighbors, um, and he was reading already history and politics and stuff like that, um, and you were discussing things with him. Did you agree with his politics, did you, or his worldview? I think the only thing that Jack and I ever differed on, Mort, was Israel. I think everything else uh, we seemed to uh, agree on. Uh, and essentially, we agreed on Israel, but Jack became such a fanatical supporter of Israel that they could literally do no wrong, and I, I didn't think that was right at all. Uh, I am a supporter of Israel, and we, Jack and I, the only hard words that we've ever had as adults were on this subject. So when he was, when we were living near each other down there in Costa Mesa, no, I, I think we both just kept discussing things and, and perhaps arguing about details. And then we'd run home and look up stuff. And, uh, and we always enjoyed the idea of surprising the other one with some fact or word that uh, uh, we were great on teasing each other about words. I would shoot a word at him that he already knew. And I'd say, Jack, that means such and such. And you could, you could see how upset he'd get over that. Or I'd use a word that he didn't know, and he'd get upset at that and have to run to look it up in the dictionary. We used to tease each other about that all the time. That was a favorite game of ours. I think that's what came from mother and that kind of thing. That, we'd, that kind of thing was what we'd toss around the dinner table when we were kids. Um, did it surprise you that he was as successful politician as he was? Or did you think he had it in him from the get-go? Mort, that's a good question. I, I don't think I was really surprised. I just, I've always seen Jack as a winner at whatever he did. And he had such a phenomenal way of finding out what he had to know in order to get someplace. Jack seemed to have an amazing ability to, uh, I don't want to say feel his way along, but to determine what was needed to win the game. And, uh, no, I can't say that I was surprised. I was always in wonderment, but never surprised. Um, did he talk to you about his political ambitions? How high he thought he could go or what he thought he could get done? Only a little bit. Jack was very private that way. Uh, uh, I, he let me know that he really thought that he had a chance at being a leader and so he thought he might have a chance at becoming president. And I think that other people encouraged him and pushed him very hard to, to do that. And so in 88, he finally took the plunge and decided to try for the nomination. Uh, but um, I don't ever recall him ever confiding in me that he ever really, really wanted to be president. I, I think it just happened. No, I don't. I don't think he ever did. I don't. I don't know that he would have with anybody, perhaps other than Joanne. Or did you uh, get involved in any of his campaign? Oh, sure. What did you do? When Jack uh, uh, ran for the nomination in '88, why uh, I had just taken a new job in New York, out on Long Island, and so Jack was going to go to New Hampshire and try to get a a good turnout and a vote in New Hampshire for the primary there. So the whole family went up. A lot of people from the family went up there. Nancy and I got on a plane, flew to Buffalo, got off, joined the campaign. They flew us to 
uh, way upstate New Hampshire, I guess we got off in the, in the capital, and uh, drove northward and uh, tramped the snows of New Hampshire and shook hands and, and made the pitch as much as we could for several days. And uh, Jack did okay, but he didn't do well enough. So then we, I look, at our, look back at ourselves as being hangers-on. We were always just outriders along with him. We went on a lot of his bus trips and his campaign trips when he was running for the vice presidency with Dole. Uh, absolutely dazzled with what that whole process was. And it was so much fun for us to just be hangers-on, as I call us. Uh, you were on his bus? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And on his plane. Uh, that's quite an experience. How did he take not doing well in 88? I think he was disappointed, but it's onward and upward for him. He was disappointed, but... Uh, it wasn't like uh, getting cut from... No, no, no. I, no, not nearly that bad. I think Jack uh, had such a spirit to him that... And he had so many friends that kept pushing him, saying, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, it'll, it'll come around again, yada, yada, yada. And uh, so I, I'm sure he was disappointed. I, I felt some of that, but not a lot. So I would, again, it's up to somebody perhaps that was closer to him at that time. Did he really want to be president? You know, Mort, that's a darn good question. I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I think that he was pushed hard. There was a strong number of people in this country that that liked him and wanted to see him in that role advanced. To this day, I'm stopped all the time by people saying, gosh, I wish your brother had and so forth. But uh, I think in the end, I, I think he was kind of relieved to not have to go through that terrible, terrible process. Do you, did you, did he, did he want to be vice president with Reagan in 1980? Did he, did you talk about that? Yeah, he did. He was very disappointed. I was in New York. Uh, I was in Long Island. Uh, I was in a meeting. I was having a, a, a national sales meeting of my guys from this country. And uh, the phone kept ringing, and they'd call me to the phone. It was Jack. He was waiting for the final answer for Bush to try to, to Bush to tell him that he was going to be the candidate. I mean, for uh, Reagan. Reagan to tell him he was going to be the candidate. And... Uh, I'm sorry, are we talking Reagan or Bush? Reagan I'm, in 80. I'm missing... Reagan, Reagan is the nominee in 80. And Jack would have, could have, might have been his vice presidential campaign. He cho chose no, Bush I, No, I'm sorry. I'm off the track. Yeah. I, don't, I don't recall that, Mark, at all. I, I was beginning to spout off on the, what happened for the, when George Bush the I uh, ended up picking Dan Quayle. Oh, I see. So he thought he had a chance then. This was very definitely, and he was very disappointed when, when it was quail. I talked to Jack probably a half a dozen times that morning, and when he finally called me and told me that they'd picked Dan Quayle, he was very crestfallen. Did he tell you what was going on? Did, that he, did he make a campaign in '88? I think Jack told me that Bush didn't trust him. I think Jack said that. I can't say what he said. I can say that I think what he felt was that that Bush regarded him as too much of a maverick, um, unreliable in that sense, uh, too much his own man, uh, unwilling to hew to the Bush party line. Um, so... What, how, what did he say about it expressing disappointment that it was when it was quail? I, I, I expressed sympathy, and he said, yeah, he said, it really hurts. Uh, he, said, I, uh, he, said, I, he said, I felt that I was really going to have the, the bid, and uh, he said, something happened this morning, and I'm not in it, and... Um, here I was in this big meeting, and I really felt bad. I felt like being by myself or talking to him, but I, I, I was tied up, and so was he. But he, I talked to him at least half a dozen times that morning. 
Okay. Um, let's go back to family history now. Uh, Dick says that you are the ultimate expert on the history of the, the, the Kemp's and the Pope's. Um, That's Dick's revenge. <laughs> so um, starting on the Kemp's side, when did the Kemp's first come to America? Holy smokes, I think it was in the mid-17th century. I think that I'm, I'm not really an expert on the genealogy of the okay. Kemp's. I've, I've read it and so is Dick, so, uh, or some of it. But uh, the, Kemp's, the Kemp's came from, I think it was, uh, I've forgotten the town in England, but they came over very early on in the 17th century, late 17th century. 1600s. Yeah, in the 1600s, I think late in the century. And I think that they, um, uh, they had been, I think, military people early on in England. And I think that's where the name came from. I think the name Kemping is, is a form of, of dueling or, or combat of some kind. I think that's where the family name came from. And I think that uh, they eventually um, became... Uh, um, What's the old word for it in those days? Uh, Indentured servants. No, not really, no. <laughs> uh, they, were, they were more entrepreneurial in that sense. They were running horses. They, they were running uh, horse rental, horse sales, uh, freight business with wagons. Um, and they settled, uh, they first settled somewhere up in Massachusetts and then gradually moved down to New York. And they ended up in Watertown, New York where they ran the business during the 19th century, during the Civil War. They apparently made a lot of money uh, running freight for the Union and uh, buying and selling horses. And so my grandfather was part of that family and went to West to round up horses, I guess, every year. And on one of those years, why he camped by a river in, in South Dakota and decided that's where he was going to go and settle eventually, I guess. And so they founded the town called Watertown, South Dakota. And the main drag there is known as Camp Avenue. And that's where he had a ranch and a, and a farm. And uh, That's John Edwin Kemp. Yes, right. No, I'm sorry. That's Oscar Paddock Kemp. Oh. Was the son of... Oscar Paddock Kemp was the son who went west hmm. to round up horses for the family business selling horses to the government. And uh, he, so it's Oscar who married Elva, right. who was your grandmother. Right. right. And who were her people? Her people were the Frenches, a, a very, very strong, relatively famous family. Um, her brother, I think it was, founded the chain of French hospitals in Los Angeles that were more or less uh, occupational hospitals, more or less uh, uh, working men's hospitals. There was a whole chain of them, and they're now called the Pacific Medical Centers or something like that, but that chain was founded by mother's brother and a uh, very, very successful guy, very, very wealthy, successful guy. And her family, uh, I think, was very notable. She had two sisters who were doctors back in uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, she had three widowed or single spinster sisters who lived together in Boyle Heights, which was then a lovely, lovely high-class area of Los Angeles. And that's where, that's where grandmother lived with her family when she came out from South Dakota. Her husband died in 1900-something, 1904-5-6. And she sold the farm and the ranch and put the whole family on a chartered railroad car, sent the oldest son out to L.A. to scout the territory, and he came back. He bought a home. And she brought the whole gang out on this railroad car, and they ended up living together out on uh, Soto Street in, in uh, East L.A. Why did they pick L.A.? Uh, the land of opportunity, uh, the land of growth, the land of prosperity, 
Uh, Dad said that they were really taken in by all of the railroad advertising. The railroads were busy promoting traffic to, to the West Coast, to California, and California was the promised land. So she had all these kids, and they had to go someplace. So she took them to what the promised land had, and uh, that, was, that was how they got here. So Elva lived with you uh, guys for a while. What was she like? And she was a great, kind of great, great she old had? lady. She had an Indian, I, I was going to say Indian background. That's not accurate. She had a ranch with her husband back in South Dakota, and they had many Indian tribes living within a distance of their house. And there were raiders, not not raiders, but there were thieves and marauders and, the, you know, dissident groups among the Indians. And uh, and one night she apparently had to, to use a gun. Uh, um, somehow, I've forgotten that story, but it was a famous story that circulated in the family. Uh, kept a gun under her pillow, I guess, for a while back there. Um, but she was steeped in Indian culture and Indian lore, and she brought that out with her. So when she lived with us, and at, she lived with us before Dick was ever born, but then she, when she, I think she was living with Uncle Jack, she'd come over and say Indian words to Jack and Dick, and she kind of filled their heads with Indian stuff, and it was kind of funny. But grandmother lived among Jack and us. She lived with us from, from the time I was two 1930 until probably 34 or 5. In 1932, the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped. And so grandmother had my dad's shop come and put bars on all of our windows in Hollywood. We grew up with these big iron bars on all of our windows in the house. Grandmother said, do it. So talk about a matriarchal society. That was sure one. And we didn't have bicycles for a long time either because she thought that was a too dangerous a, a vehicle, and so mother finally went out and bought us all bikes. Said to heck with all of you, Dad. You can, you can, your mother can figure out how you're going to deal with this. So she influenced your dad very much. So yeah. Dad was extremely loyal to her. Again, that's why I keep talking him about talking about him having a, a really old-fashioned loyalty to his mother. It was very touching. So on your mother's side, um, how, did the, how did the popes get to South Dakota? Again, an English immigrant to, to New England. And uh, so you're all daughters of the American Revolution. I think so, yeah. Mother Revolution. was a member of the DAR. Uh, you know, speaking of heroes, um, I'm trying to think of her name. It doesn't pop right up to me, but Anderson, that woman, the, the black woman that was a famous mezzo-soprano. Uh, Marian Anderson. Yeah. Mother used to worship her a lot and used to talk about her being denied the chance to to sing in Washington and finally putting on that great concert at the, I think it was the Lincoln Memorial. And Mother used to really worship her, spoke very, very highly of her. Uh, what was your subject, Mort? I well, let me, let me just stop you there. Um, so Jack Kemp's tolerant attitude, which is famous, you know, his biracial, non-racial attitude precedes his football days. I would say a little bit more, but I think that came from sports. I think 95% of that came from being dependent upon strong black players protecting his rear end during games. I think he, he traveled with them, practically lived with them during the season. So I think that's where that came from. Um, so back to the family. So what do you know about Gershom Pope and Lucy Catlett? The Catlets I know very little about except they had some prominent people in the family. One was a general, a famous general. Uh, Gershom Barlow was a, uh, a wild and woolly rancher, sheep and cattle, uh, headquartered in Miles City in eastern Montana. and. Um, had apparently at times uh, hundred, many hundreds of thousands of acres, perhaps millions of acres of land, uh, especially as the market would, would rise for sheep and cattle while he'd expand his, his size of his acreage. 
and war times were the best times for him. Uh, World War I apparently was a huge time of expansion because the country was seeking hides and, and meat and uh, wool and and uh, so he ended up in World War I uh, quite wealthy, uh, quite, he was the first guy to own a car in Miles City. Uh, his wife died when mother was nine so mother was raised in a male family with with uh, three brothers and uh, and her dad in the house. Her dad was a real crusty Wild West guy. You met him? No, I was apparently his favorite child <laughs> when I was very young. Mother took us to Montana on the train a couple times. Me, but uh, uh, I never knew him. No, I was too young. He died, a mother said, of a broken heart in 1929, I think it was. The, the depression ruined him. The crash ruined him, apparently. Uh, How that particular crash would ruin a rancher, I'm not altogether sure, but perhaps he was highly leveraged or something. In, in the so uh, how long did your folks live? Dad lived until he was 80, and mother lived, uh, gee, I think she was just, uh, I think she passed away in 69. I think she was probably only 70 years old. Heart. Dad had a stroke. Mother had, I think, had a heart attack and passed away. And how did Jack take their deaths? Uh, just about like the rest of us, it was tough, very tough. Jack was away, I think, for both, both events. I think he was living in Buffalo uh, for both events, I think. Or Washington, D.C., perhaps, when I'll have to go back and think about those dates. I can't remember. But, but Jack, uh, I think he was very, very, very upset, and uh, like all of us were, and flew out. We never had a funeral for either parent, which is a a Christian science sort of thing. Um, I think he flew out to be with us, though, after both. Um, so w when Jack himself got sick, did you talk to him a lot about how he felt, what, whether he was wor how worried he was? How did you learn about the diagnosis? He called me and told me. Uh, he called me often then during that time, and, and as the suspicion grew, it was never at first known. I mean, it wasn't a decision. It was just a, a possibility. And uh, he was told that it was a, a likely problem, but he kept saying there was always this chance and that chance of not having it go further. And then I think one day he called me up. I think it was a Sunday afternoon. He said, hey, I... It's, it's terminal now. They've told me that it's, uh, I've only got, I think he said, three months to live. I think that's about right, too. I think that's about all he did, he did live. He went very, very quickly. But I think he was um, at first worried, and then I think he just calmed down and accepted it. Uh, here again, I, I wasn't that close to know, but uh, every time he talked to me, he seemed uh, at first alarmed and then subdued. And did he have a, a kind of religious attitude toward it? I mean, did he talk? I mean, more not to my knowledge. Or? More not to my knowledge. Dick, Dick might have more knowledge of that than I would. Dick, flew, we both of us flew back, but at different times. I flew back and spent a long weekend with him. I think it was four or five days. Dick, Dick flew back and spent some time with him, or came through on a trip. And uh, I think Dick got into religion with him, but I did not. So we're just about to the end. Is, is there anything I've missed about who Jack Kemp was or that the world ought to know about? I, I, uh, impatience was a, a big characteristic. I think that his need to fit in and desire to get inside the group was what, what gave him his nature. Uh, to me, that's been the key to how he turned out like he did. He was number three in the, in the list of seniority and uh, had to push his way into the crowd in order to make it. And he did that for the rest of his life.
sports, politics. Uh, he was always an outsider in a way when you stop and think about it. Which created drive and focus. Sure, on. you bet. That was always him trying to get over that hurdle and get in and be accepted and win the game or win the point or win the argument or win the battle, whatever the battle was. Great. Well, Paul Kemp, thank you very much for doing this. She thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about a great guy. Okay, good. Thank you.